The way mother shows up over the series of weeks and then you get to the end and you pull something together. One of the concerns that I have is that we have this body of work and there's a bit of you had to be there to get it type of quality to it. I do feel sometimes the work that I'm doing, it's a little bit like teardrops that 30 seconds later, it's gone. People have the release, but there's no residue. There's nothing left of it when it's over. There's like so much gold. There's the mother, there's the whole way starlight has appeared and the ending of starlight. There are things that could be captured, would be beneficial. I think people would be really interested to know that there are ways to move through the feelings that they're stuck with. It doesn't have to be chronic. Before we can call the tree spirits back to start to revitalize them, there's still work to do with really feeling the depth of what is being reckoned right now, where the roots are, because we can't heal it at the superficial level. We can't heal it at the level it's being presented to us. We actually have to find the original wounds before we can do the healing. Yeah. You might have been trained in more methods of how the abyss navigation steps occur for having to really honor the grief before the magic can come in the room, kind of. You have to go to the edge of the abyss, face that blackness, that kind of infinite dark night of the soul, and stand right at the precipice of it, and you have to jump in. When you land at the bottom, that's where you find the resources that bring you out. Then that process of that initiation becomes cyclical. That's where the power is. And for where we are in history, where we are culturally and as a species, we have to be able to, to recreate that circular motion. And using the same tools of tuning in, representing, looking systemically, looking for who's been left out, who's not included, who needs acknowledgement, and to start working the parts of ourselves that have been excluded so that we can start to harmonize our own being and claim all these parts of ourselves. And for that, find more balance and meaning in our life. That's my method of doing it. I mean, I've called in particular people that want to do that. 20 people, they know what they're in for with me. Not everybody's up for it. It's not personal work. This program is about looking at what's really happening. And how can you contribute in a meaningful way to what's next, what wants to happen after this? I am in alignment with what you want. Yeah, we need the tree spirits. We need the angels. We need sacred music, sacred geometry. We need all those resources of the divine presences that are here for us. And I agree with what you're saying. I mean, we're saying the same thing. What's blocking us is that we're not dealing with our grief. This was good stuff. I want to take some cuts from it. Good. How long have you known you were a wizard? Oh, I think I just turned a wizard this summer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've been a magician. I think I became a wizard this year. And the difference in your mind? The difference is that as a magician, I don't do anything and magic happens around me. And as a wizard, you're orchestrating. And as a wizard, I'm taking more responsibility for my magic. Yeah. I'm kind of co-creating it more. Yeah. Huh. The headmaster of the wizard school, I'm cool with. But I don't want to be the head wizard in the wizard school. Because it takes away from, like, everybody's a wizard. If everybody's a wizard, you don't need a head wizard. The breakout room thing gets me out of being the one who knows how to solve everyone's problems that they don't know how to solve. People can be empowered to figure it out for themselves. Okay, well, congratulations for wisdom. Thanks, yeah, well. <laughs> I'm amazed at the depth of the mystery revealed. I got a lot more out of it looking back at like, oh, the little hidden gems. And so that's why I want you to qualify it. The woman who started 
she had just a, like a very human issue about being in this pandemic and finding that she's just retreating into isolation. And it was also around enough, the kind of this borderline between what's stillness and kind of meditative and what's just collapsed and retreated. Like is the hermit just avoiding or is the hermit transcending? And so that was her question. It was kind of the same topic, striving mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. resonant expression. Mm -hmm. You evoked the sacred at the very beginning through the meditation. And, and then the voices that were picked were church and what that story has been. And the vicars and the wives were like, where's my husband? Where's the mom? I, like, where's the other half? They're not together. They're not present together. They don't feel each other. And that subtle listening isn't happening. And Heartbroken was really focused on honoring this dead child. But all that focus is being put on that dead child that's like the grief of the entire human embodiment in this confusing conundrum of, as one wife said, I feel like a loyal dog that's been kicked, but I'm still loyal. It's a painful wake up or way to be asked to ride around in this super magical world. And then there, there's a couple of aspects that come in. Was it I have a voice that said that they just came out of the swamp with the grass hanging from them as a swamp thing and mm -hmm. with the guttural growl and that it was really important, the part that the swamp grass was hanging from them the aspect that kept being mentioned too about if there's a resonance i'll listen to it not if you think you're big and important and you're, but if you're activating your own expression and through resonance and you don't get covered with swamp grass unless you've been dragging through it rolling in it and it's the opposite of civilization, somebody even said. I have a voice in that same bet. And at the conclusion, the answer for the art of enough, one representative said, I am enough, I just am. Turn inwards more. I'm able to hear the quiet voices. It's a new kind of enoughness. And it's not really new. It's just been forgotten for thousands of years and discounted. There's a lot to be said with just going with the flow, much as the topic of this one was revealing. The push and striving, am I enough, am I enough, versus the art of accepting and allowing expression to move through us. And That's where I'm heading. I'd like to really be able to access mythic consciousness archetypes mm -hmm. you got to pull that in though right to some degree nothing's gonna keep us from jumping into the air oh, oh i think i'm a, I'm a kangaroo ah, what a reality Jack Blackwell mentioned you, and he said that you have an affinity with the perpetrator and that you invite that in, and his is more about the inner child, and so it's that aspect of vulnerability that's almost always showing up and invited in, and I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah, that's very true. He does do a lot with inner child, and I always want to welcome the perpetrator, because otherwise you don't know where it is creates a dangerous situation if it's not identified yeah and when you identify it then it can that energy can move and people can work with it in a safer way 
So that's partly why I do it. And also because it's, it is the really prominent energy that we're working with between the perpetrator and the inner child. Those are two of the, the big energies. It's not, this is not a new religion of moralism. You know, be smaller than your parents and your life will go well. It's, I mean, it, there, there's an aspect where you can translate it into those kind of principles, but it's about our ancestors overpowering our own desires and intentions through entanglement. It's about when you start taking care of your mother, what, you know, what happens and you're, you're not even aware you're doing it because you started doing it at one year old, two years old or less or in utero. You know, this is like an infant movement. Mother is not loving me. How can I get mother to love me? Mother can't love me because her heart is in pain. There's a pain. I'm going to travel to the place where the pain originates. And I'm going to try to heal it there. And so that draws the baby out of order into their grandmother's place, which is where the wounding came from. And now that's where they are existing from, trying to heal their mother so that their mother can then be a good mother for them. And then, you know, you just go to the self-help section of your bookstore and then you see all the titles of all the things that happened because of that. <laughs> Every book is about that. Oh, it's simple, but so complicated. Oh. You name something you want. We'll figure out what's in the way. We'll move that out of the way. And then you can go move towards it. I guess I picture it as it actually transmute. It's an actual transformation that happens. It doesn't even exist anymore. It, it ascends in a certain way. It releases. But it's not like here. So it, it could be gone completely where they usually move to the past where they belong. So they're not gone. They're just in the past. They're not blocking your step. They're not on your shoulders, weighing you down or tugging at you from behind and holding you back. So it's finding another place for it. Yeah. I do think it needs a place, even if it ascends and goes into the light. There's multiple ways to hold it, like lost children. So they can ascend and go into the light. And there's still, there's still a presence. So it's an and both. Feel deep. There we grow again. Ah, the smiling lines inside me. As I grow. Inside me as I grow. That was a really intense meeting. We definitely reached into guilt and innocence in a potent way. And I guess first, I'm interested in just your impressions, what it was like for you to witness all that. What were your takeaways? The aspect of ownership, it could have been missed easily. She kind of threw that in as an afterthought. I own him now, her husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just this morning, I was talking about circumcision and the ownership aspect and how people are put immediately into trauma for their entire lives that way as the beginning. And I think it goes under acknowledged in our culture at large that there's a background conversation about us being owned and how critical that is to bring to light. And just in terms of the mystery unraveling of the aspect that the father has to be super on point with premature aggression because on the subliminal, he actually feels threatened by the aggressiveness that's in his son mm -hmm. that his mother doesn't even see. So just that complete flip from what was thought to be the issue how we can get in through the back door of our cultural agreements and reset the whole framework once things like this are revealed. And another huge aspect was the husband not feeling like he could express himself sexually, like that there was just no room at all to wiggle there. And that sensuality and eroticism or sexuality or didn't feel like there was even a place at the table, uh, which I guess is a very common theme too. It seems like you guys have honed in on that. 
which makes sense since we're in this puritanical kind of culture. So the whole thing sort of opened up a view of how much room there is for change in our culture, but also that there is a place where we can find balance and freedom of expression. So that seems pretty huge as far as a revelation for this constellation. It gave a glimmer of hope. But as we can start to just own what the reality is, then you get into this space of possibility. So when the wife is simply in the position of my husband is violent against our child and hates him and I have to protect him. I have to protect the son from the father. She's like so stuck in that place. And the three of them then become stuck and none of them have any possibility of anything else. The father's aggressive, the mother's can't move because she has to be in between them. That's the only place she can occupy. And the son who's an adult actually is equally trapped. He can't go into his adult life. He's trapped in this line. But when she then takes off the cloak of innocence, my husband is angry because of this situation and rages him. I'm not having sex with him, but I've had sex with other people. I'm winning my son affection as his protector. All those things, all those truths come out. She doesn't have to stand there anymore. What is she doing there? She can now they can all start asking questions of like, well, let's reconfigure this relationship. Maybe this, this doesn't have to just perpetuate until he's 40. Until, you know, one of them goes into a nursing home or one of them, you know, he gets sick. I feel like if people are aligned with their soul and their soul purpose, because we only have, we have this like temporary life in this crazy family and crazy world. And we have a few years to have a human experience. And the best human experience we can have is when we're aligned with our soul. The more lost we are from our soul, disconnected from our soul, the worse the quality of our human experience. Or the, the less happiness we experience or harmony as the case may be. All of those are, right, are inside that. We become trapped in these situations, all different kinds of situations, relationships, jobs, living situations, trapped in, in everything that degrades our human experience, makes it repetitive and frozen and conflicted. And when we speak the truth, own the truth of what we're doing, rather than making our partner the bad guy, and he's holding all of the guilt and where they are protecting, we're the protector. But when we own the truth, we can reconnect to our soul. What do we want to do in this lifetime? What are we here for? And I think that will ultimately lead more towards that harmony and happiness. And it's complex because the society we are in punishes people who are in contact with their own soul. It's like illegal. And the less power you have, the more illegal it is to be in contact with your own soul. It's not so easy. It's not a simple formula. Just connect with your soul in life. You're going to have more health and happiness. But I do think it's a place to begin. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess that's what you're inviting with this container, myth and magic, especially. Right. There's, I think what's happening now is that this external consciousness is becoming more and more active in people's lives as a resource. So that's another aspect of this is, is soul, but also to connect to the resources of consciousness, of ancestral consciousness and spirit consciousness star beings. I can rock. I can swing my heartbeat into a hopeful dream block. I can wait. I can rock. And if I do, I'll be on the way to the goal, the direction of my heart. Take me to breakout room I think it was the perfect way to fully step into the constellation of 
Trump and the election. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, I would, that's what I was going for. I was trying to create some continuity to be able to do that constellation and prime us. That was the design. Hopefully it um, was a good segue. I'm kind of working from feel and hoping that I'm, I'm able to provide an experience in these three parts of the teaching and then the more interpersonal space where people can kind of just be with their own experience. So it's not so, you know, large group. And then the, then the large group where we can do, you know, more of the collectives. And I, I had gotten a number of people had said that using an individual as the portal into the collective field felt a bit indirect and that I could just work from just access the bigger field through my own portal, just kind of feel into what we could, what we could work with, what felt alive for me in the collective oh, uh -huh. and w work from that 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 I could use myself as the entree. Ah, yeah. I wondered how that had come up. And of course, the timing makes it seem like that in itself was enough. That's interesting. What was your response to the constellation? Viewing it the first time and then reviewing it the second time? So the first time I was with the grandparents, that all of them felt sort of disassociated and sad and overwhelmed and when the part was mentioned about um, the grandmother being shipped from Scotland to the United States and ending up marrying a whorehouse owner under the, at the time, paradigm that surrounded that, which is, wasn't exactly free and empowering for the women. I just was sobbing, sobbing. I thought, wonderful thing that you put in there, Trump, one year in the future that by picking an object in the future, you asked the constellation to move forward instead of backwards. And I thought, oh, that's like a major ingredient, right? That critical landmark point for focusing forward because usually in my experience of constellations so far, it seems that it's more dealing with the moment in the past. I uh, sobbed again when brothels said that the change is going to happen within and, le and let that settle into you. Maybe I'm just especially raw, but I just was really touched by it. Interestingly, in my mind, I remembered when Trump was like, now I'm engaged, but only with these two. And I'm toggling back and forth between this hidden goodness and in my mind, I thought it was the divine whore, but it turns out it was the people of the USA, which I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's even better because the mother was missing from the constellation. Like, where's the mother energy? Let's replace it with the whore or with some kind of a diversion. And it shows a motherly nurturing to toggle between innate goodness and the people in your fields. I mean, that's the, that's what you would hope from a good leader. And so to have him captivated by that was super encouraging. That also opened a big door of, we've really got to learn to harness our power to be able to hold this and deal with the immensity of what it is that's up in the field because it's not like he was just hurt by his mother you know our whole world is under some influences that are super powerful to align with but not necessarily aware of compassion or what's best for our species or the planet so that was interesting and i wonder how you feel about that that aspect. Mm. The question I had and the question I was left with is, is that possible to do? Can you call on, on ancestors of the president to support him in getting the shit together? Because he's, he's entangled. I mean, I felt in the maternal field. He, he's entangled with his mother and his mother's mother and that, that Scottish family and the victims of his paternal lineage.
as we were looking for the healing movement and we were working with the ancestors, his parents and his grandparents, and asking for their support in this way and the way that they showed up to support him. You know, is it possible that, we're, that that resource will actually become available to him in a different way? Like his ancestors, his grandparents will begin to be able to access him. As I had said in, in my talk, you know, the work that we're doing in Constellations is to call the ancestors in to release the entanglements and then kind of flip the script, turn the energy that has been pulling people back into where the orders of love are out, where there are violations of the orders of love. The entanglement pulls the children back into the system to maintain the structure and order of the system. It's this conservative force that uses new life to support these older structures. And when we're able to bring what has been excluded into the field and acknowledge it and give the place a belonging to who was excluded, it then frees the entangled child to no longer occupy that space, to have to kind of like the boy with his finger in the dike that if we bring an ancestral, the excluded person that's creating that hole in the dike that the child's stuck holding, they're free. And then they can move forward into their life. And then what had been the energy of entanglement turns into an energy of blessing. You have to separate the person from the action and see the person with love. And that that is a big part of the answer. She played the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Disconnect person from actions, find the love for the person. The ancestors need to heal. And that ancestral consciousness is a resource that we're just completely cut off from. We're so thoroughly cut off from it that we, we deny that it even exists. And so the, the healing movement in that constellation with Mary McLeod Trump and Mary Smith McLeod and that maternal lineage. And that is the resource the narcissist, the narcissist, the narcissist is falling in love with his own reflection and totally obsessed with himself because he's not feeling his mother's love. He's cut off from his mother's love. Like he's getting from his reflection what he wanted and didn't get from his mother, which is mommy loving me. That's what he's missing. And so he's in this, we call it narcissistic, but it's it's a lack of, of mother's love. It's like the mother's face is who he wants. Look, he wants to look at his mother's face and hear, I love you. And, and when she's absent, he's looking at his own reflection and getting it from his own reflection and just goes into this spin of narcissism. And he, this guy is like so deep into it. He's like mad. The mother can't show up for him because of her trauma. And grandmother is traumatized. And then we're back to the Highland clearances. And it brings us back to the beginning of the corporations and how the corporations, when they formed the British East India Company, the first thing they did was they killed the women en masse, hundreds of thousands of women. Women's wisdom and the knowledge of healing and plant medicine and spirit, they called it witch hunting but it was basically an extermination campaign against women's wisdom. And all through Europe, they killed off hundreds of thousands of, of wise women and they created this disconnect. And so it's, it seems a little abstract and outrageous that that is going to solve this political problem that we're in, but it, it is the big missing piece. It's what we need to be able to create something different is we have to bring those women, those mothers back in and include them. If you take it to the most personal form, it's adult, usually parental child abuse. So it doesn't tell the whole story, 
we can also look and see how this shadow perpetrator is inside of us, how he is in us. We are also part of the same system. We are also the children of those who were displaced and those that did the displacing. It's all in our DNA. We have all of that. We have sacred prostitutes. We have exploited prostitutes. We have rapists. We have lords and princes that work people, slave owners, all of that. It's all embedded in us. Just the probabilities of genetics. We have everything within us. And so we're looking outside and identifying the villain outside, but we're not seeing how we can use him as a mirror to then create the portal into our own being and be able to start recognizing and working with the shadow perpetrator within us. There's something about the choice of how we come into the family, how our soul inhabits a child in that family that serves a bigger purpose. And if we keep service to soul in terms of this larger purpose, there, our soul did not come here to just be greedy. That is our wounded entanglement with our childhood and our family system. That service to our own wounded, service to our mother wound, service to our father wound. Our and pain it's, body, as Eckhart Tolle would call it. Right. Service to our pain bodies. That kind of selfish, greedy, destructive, as we saw in this constellation this week, that's a child expressing their mother wound, projecting their mother wound and their father wound on the whole world and being supported in it by all the people whose place of childhood tantrum that no one ever validates. He's like hugely popular with people who can identify with the child having a tantrum that has no power. And that's his whole base is comprised of people that are trapped in their own childhood wounds and, and no one ever speaks to them about it. No one ever touches their heart. And he is hugely popular. And the more outrageous and outlandish childish toddler behavior he does, you know, selfishness, he enthralls his base because he's touching people's childhood wounds that don't get addressed. As far as suppression spells for our species at large, have you ever heard of service to self versus service to other? Not as a meme. It's easy to make service to self look like the bad guy and it's considered the bad guy to many. And I'm personally focused a lot on the narcissism aspect of our culture, like the whole name calling you're a narcissist thing. And, and rather like we were talking the other day about women being pinned as hysterical or whatever the mental illness label is for the day. I feel that making service to self a bad thing is kind of like saying, don't look at that you would want to be in balance so that everyone can be in balance. It's a way of twisting it. It's like, if somebody's going to say you're narcissistic as an insult, then you're not going to be inclined to deeper reflect too much for fear of being called a narcissist. Mm-hmm. And so then this opportunity to really come into balance is given up because you're running away from it because you don't want to be called a narcissist. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, thinking that in some way, find a way to show that, that there's been a spell asking us to not embrace. The service to self, I can speak a little bit about how I'm understanding that in this context. It's a, it's a little bit of a new new thinking about it, but there is philosophically, uh, like 60, 60 years ago, whatever, Anne Rand, you know, she wrote Atlas Shrugged and uh, The Fountainhead, I think, or whatever the book was. And she came with this philosophy that everybody acting for their own personal selfish best interests, that that was for the greatest good. And if everybody's acting in their own self-interest, then 
the collective will be all acting in its own best interest. And people ran with that. You know, it's in libertarianism, it's in with the like free market economy of the Republicans. It's, it's still quite alive, even though, you know, she's not spoken of that much, but her legacy is still very present. And in a way it created this like generation of really greedy, selfish people that thought that the way to fight world hunger is to have a full stomach. That's what it became. Yeah, it's easy to pollute it. Right. And then the Democrats have this other philosophy, more kind of socialist, is that everybody needs to contribute to the greater good. Like more of like a Swedish model is that the collective will do the best for everyone if it is resourced. If we resource the collective and create back and forth flow to take care of people's needs, we make some value statements that everybody gets healthcare, everybody gets educated, the roads get paved, the common good, the collective good, we're going to resource that. And then it will reflect back to people, even though any given moment, someone's paying a lot of tax money to the healthcare system, but they're not sick, but eventually they may be sick or they will be sick. And at that point, then they can take out of the healthcare system and it'll all balance out in the, in the end. And that's kind of, you know, more of a, like a a socialist system. And that has become identified. Like those are the good people. The good people are the ones who think about what's best for everyone. And the bad people are the ones that only think about what's good for themselves. And I think you kind of spoke to that, how, service to self has this kind of shade on it of being bad. To me, the part that's missing is integrity and what integrity means when you really embody it, because then you're not going to be interested in service to self to the degree that it stomps on other people. You're going to be in service to self so that you can thrive so that everyone can thrive the background conversation is the integrity of the whole it's coming from a place of nurturing instead of a place of like trauma and it's just mine kind of thing uh anyway i think that's why it's such a delicate balance and then that's so easy to cast one or the other out as a well, that's not complete and it creates imbalance, whether it's too much food in your belly or it's too much, let's make it all so thin that nobody gets to utilize their gifts. Cause I I don't know if you know the Harrison Bergeron story by Mm -hmm. Ray Bradbury. It's like a short story about everyone's gonna be equal. And so Mm -hmm. the dancer balls and chains are put on her feet. The smart guy, like he's got an alarm going off in his head every 15 seconds so that he can't follow a thought through. And so then nobody thrives. Mm -hmm. The background conversation, I guess, is um, thrival Mm -hmm. for all. Because why wouldn't you want that for your species? Mm -hmm. In my latest framing, I would change self to soul. Service to soul. Right. Service to soul. I love that. That that our self remains when our body goes. And the word for that part is soul. And our soul incarnates, comes into our body in this incarnation, in this lifetime, with some purpose, something that's here to experience, something that's here to learn, something that's here to complete. And if we are able to be aware of that purpose of why we're here, what this lifetime is about from a soul perspective, it then informs what the service is. We're in service to our soul, which means our greater purpose for being here, the lesson that we're here to learn, what we're here to complete or to gain from a soul basis, then we leave our bodies and then we have had this human experience. So we come for it a particular type of human experience and we're challenged, we're often born into a family that is oppositional to our sole purpose. So it kind of sets us up. And then where you went to it at the beginning of this conversation of how girls especially are just indoctrinated that their own needs should go unmet. 
in favor of taking care of other people. They're taught to lie, to not hurt other people's feelings and to sacrifice their own wants and needs for the betterment of somebody else, whoever it is, like everybody else really deserves it more than they do. And, and this is the whole culture of the way girls are raised is for everyone else, not for you. And so there's a lot of undoing that has to occur, undoing these wounds and allowing women now who've like grown up with this to actually recognize that it's, it's okay for them to be in service to themselves because they, that's always the person that comes last. Like you can, you can take care of yourself after everybody is fed, the dishes are cleaned and the children are in bed and the men are watching TV and smoking cigarettes. And now the, the women can sit in the kitchen for a few minutes and, and like have some time for themselves. But everybody has to be taken care of first before you get anything for yourself. So now w women actually need to find a place that it's okay to put themselves first, that they don't have to take care of everybody before they take care of themselves. That service to self as well is actually can be validated because it's, it's in response to the indoctrination of how they've been raised where it's been forbidden. Yep, delicate balance. And, and it's, uh, I, I don't know if you caught it when brothels said that it seemed like it was require people to be raised in a new environment to embody their divinity. So there's less work to do to end up fully embodied to own being fully embodied. Right, it would be, um... Yeah, great if it starts catching on. I mean, I think the generation of children that are being born now, things are shifting. We're moving towards children having more supportive childhoods where possible, but it's still a, it's still a big work in progress. Yeah, we're, we are traumatizing people without healing them, which I, I, don't, I don't like to do. And we're working with these big collective fields, that's where we're ending up. We're ending up with not finding healing movements. And I'm kind of warning people in advance that we're going to open up your field and raise all your trauma. And we're not really going to heal it. And that may not feel good to you. It's a very thin line between re-traumatizing someone. We talk about, oh, here is you were raped and here you were molested. And, you know, then you were in a psychiatric ward and you know then you put on all these drugs i mean it's not necessarily healing just to do a life review of all of that i did a session with her yesterday she reached out for support she has other therapists that she goes to and she's worked with the last two weeks for her have been kind of monumental in terms of being able to release some of the trauma that she's holding in her body and it's not just from her experience, but, you know, her mother, her grandmother, all the, you know, the, the women ancestors, she has become a kind of a receptacle for the female trauma in her family because the pattern in her family is to shut down, to not say anything, just absorb it all. And our sexuality is amputated in a way because of the conditioning that we have to self-immolate, implode around sexual trauma. And so she's not just working with her own field and her own life experience, but she's working also with her inheritance. And I think it's been a really positive experience for her, but the constellation didn't do it. The constellation just opened the trauma. You know, what feels like kind of a bit of a patronizing pat on the head is for me is an outcome of not really being able to come to resolution, not be able to really do a healing the same way we would do if we were in a live group. You know, we wouldn't leave it in the middle. We wouldn't like introduce all her trauma and just display it all and then stop. We would continue and find the healing movement. I just find it really challenging on Zoom. It's actually, a, it's a teaching 
environment to teach people how to work with these tools to be able to work with this, these kind of collective traumas. And I think it's meeting that goal. And this is like a group of people who have done decades worth of spiritual and somatic work on their wounding. Where the resolution lies is that we have to expand beyond our narrative of living in a dead universe, which is the place where people are struggling with their depression and their anxiety and their sense of being disempowered and that their lives are meaningless and unimportant. Inside of them, there is actually a life force that they are cut off from. Tusks are growing out of my face like uh, one of those wild birds. I got this feeling everyone's gonna think I'm dangerous. So stay away. Session seven, the business that she said she worked for, she wasn't allowed to work with constellations anymore, considered a witch. Well, a lot of stuff came up that seems to come <clears throat> back to the original division of man and woman being able to trust one another. I thought it was super interesting that Asar showed up. I find it accurate in terms of the current paradigm. I mean, I myself and most women I know my age are kind of off the market because we've been manipulated so much in order for people to have intimacy. And it doesn't feel authentic. I thought it was very interesting what Dancing in the Sand said about the stolen embodiment of the beloved, like embodying the beloved instead of just for pleasure. And that so many people feel like they're drowning and they're reaching for something. And it seems like pleasure is a good thing to reach for. And there's not much room at all for actually relating with the divine. So I thought it was a fabulous topic, having a house that's primarily for honoring the women and yet offering an opportunity for men to learn to relate to women, a way of relearning how to honor one another's boundaries. The fact that her dad's been in that position for some weeks now, she said, mm -hmm. just like Asar, who was wondering about his penis being taken away and how do you embody magic when you don't have that part and you're too powerful and yet now you've had your power taken away from you. And obviously it's the same on the women's side and how abandonment plays into that inability for either one to show up. I feel like that thread's being continued I know more about Osiris, people get like the one line, you know, oh, he's the god of magic or he's the, you know, the god of the moon or something, or they know some little snippet about Osiris. But not the part where he lost his penis. <laughs> right. Not the part where he's like crippled and is functioning because he's not allowed because he's like <laughs> debilitated, not only physically, but mentally we're still living inside of that myth of the, the, like the man chopped into pieces and the woman kind of like the bird, like searching the world, trying to find her broken man and then trying to like put him back together. And these themes are still, they're so with us. That's just an illustration of something that for me, I'm just like really fascinated by it. The fact that you mentioned that your grandfather had rewritten the uh, Torah, the Torah, um, which I, I guess is the Jewish Bible mm -hmm. version of yeah, um, mystical writings. 
and that his wife is the one that threw it away. So it's kind of that same story of cutting off the penis and total disregard, disconnect. I thought it was interesting that Hush came in and that there's a desire to survive, but you have to be quiet and stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. And what that says about the safety of the container. Once again, the daughter of the women in the house was being left out. And in fact, when the close happened, you said, have you spoken yet? And you didn't even remember her speaking. And she played the daughter of the women in the house. But that only speaks to how uh, that I'm blocked around hearing that. It's not, it's not a defense. It's actually an admission. Right. And when when that daughter was speaking, I I was unable to even recognize where whose voice it was. A man who really living in his ten to fourteen year old boy for weeks now, and he slept with his sister for several years. He says that she initiated it, he feels. And then when she was 14, she didn't want to do it anymore, so he quit. I see pictures of, like, that same thing where the man, like, desires for the pleasure, and he sees a source for it, and then he wants to own it on top of that. And that he's not seeing at all that a 14-year-old needs room to play with and practice her sensual prowess and embodiment without it being penetrated and that confuses a lot of people not just boys but men and everyone and it just feels really up in the field like as a 14 year old you're really in your woman body now yet you don't have enough practice to have made it safe and you're bringing in information for the new generation at the same time that you're embodying your woman and so how to hold space for that. Anyway, it was just interesting that that came up. I used that example to show it just feels like it's really up in the field. He feels hugely conflicted about owning the perpetrator aspect of it. And he's been playing victim for weeks now. It's almost intolerable, actually, as he goes through it to witness. Because I'm like, just claim your strength, claim your power, make reparations. Like... What would that look like? I can imagine some things. And we all have some kind of perpetration like that that's happened. So, you know, as the as a masculine was saying, we have in us all the time, the king, the lover, the magician, to use all your resources. And why do we cut those out? I mean, obviously it's the entanglements and fear. It's the same story of like, how do we honor the boundary? How are you allowed to show up with sensuality without it being assume that it's for you, how do you honor it instead of own it? What did you make of the story told about the house and the woman? When she first said the woman in her voice deeply impacted by that essence, the desire to claim that as her mother, it goes to show, as you were saying, that wise elder women were knocked off and killed. And so most of us for the last hundreds of years haven't had access to a mother that holds wisdom. And so to have that embody in a house that's squarely groundly rooted is such an encouraging sight and brings up so much disappointment that it hasn't been like that mm -hmm. in the last hundreds of years and even the house saying like i'm here i can be utilized for this i'm just waiting like are you actually going to act on this the strength of the root and the you know the walls of the house backing that a shaman girl is staying this week and she does it as a profession and you know does plant medicine guided tours and such with people and explorations and She's a mess in terms of this actual existence and taking care of money and making sure she has good shoes and that kind of thing. Like she's just a mess and there's no house. There's no house for it. Mm -hmm. So I think that that part's very important on, on that level. I was really feeling that mess up in our ability to show up as different individual magical beings. There's like this set, you're supposed to look like this. And then we'll accept you as a powerful magician. 
But if you don't, if you show up in this huge variety of possibilities, there's not a place for it right now. So I think that kind of covers how I felt about the woman in the house and the house. Yeah, how did you feel about it? I just thought the story was like so perplexing. I, I was all like balled up in trying to figure out what actually happened. And in doing that, I was kind of trampling on the flowers of the more, you know, dream state of where everybody else was going with it, allowing that dream to open up the field to like a different kind of magical place. And people were dropping in and coming up with all types of mythical and magical. And mean, meanwhile, I'm calculating, you know, the, the grandfather and the rugs. And the, I probed for it a couple of times, asking who is the mother. And it didn't go anywhere. Well, it did. It did. It went hugely. I thought that was a great question. It was wonderful that you asked the two times that you did. Because it gave an opportunity to really make it clear that this is uh, an archetypical icon mm -hmm. and for all of us, but for her especially, because she's had this idea that that was her mother instead of her mother. So now maybe she can embrace her mother actually in a new way at the same time that she really honors this archetype that she came from. Right, okay, so it did, I mean, that's where it, it didn't, it didn't fit my like missing, you know, switched at birth question. It didn't go, it didn't confirm that she was switched at birth, but right. it opened up this other space that was much more interesting than what I was thinking of. But, but that's just my, you know, my Agatha Christie curiosity of trying to solve the mystery from these clues. We went in a different direction. I just do the meditation as a way of just having some closure so that they can complete their representation. And, and kind of call in some images of themselves and just feel in their body and come to some place where we can complete. It is a wonderful space that we create with all of our focus and intent and a great opportunity in the universe to have some shift happen. I'd still like to hear a little something about what would open if we could actually experience this shadow perpetrator like what's possible on the other side just kind of to give people a, something to set as an anchor in the future I think that's really important for growth even though you don't head straight for it like to have something to aim for we have perpetrating energy within us it's in our sexual energy it's in our appetites it's in our desire for forward movement with our free will and choice by looking at this shadow that could be transformed from what we're seeing currently, which is pretty depraved. Right. If we can disentangle from those systemic forces, that then creates the ground where we can start exercising our free will. sexuality what was your what was your sense so it was a, it was a lot more open of a format it, the, the results seemed to be opening up into the more sort of magic bath of being present on earth the mother earth and the moon and the stars came in i feel like people being allowed to shift their representation encouraged to do so to something that more directly embodies our ability to wave our magic wand in life was a really great move. Despite your black and blue Ooh, It's just all a matter of perception, baby. No love you gave It's more than the memories in myself and lives in never was in vain It built me and breathe. For a judge, a judge has to walk a pretty narrow band in terms of being able to speak truth to power. So he's working in the seams of like how chaotic everything is, 
basically you can do anything and nobody notices because the whole system is in such a state of breakdown that the conservative forces of the system, they are hit and miss. And there's a lot of places that they're not operating because it's too big and too chaotic and there's too much going on. Kind of been free to do his thing. And now he's kind of reached the threshold of people noticing what he's doing. And then of course, at that point, then the resistance appears. You know, when you're traveling kind of through the levels of the basement up to the ground floor, no one pays any attention. But now he's trying to get to the second floor, the third floor. He's just going to bring the parties in. They're going to do a constellation. Everybody's going to shake hands, sign the papers, case is closed. So of course, the, all the, the attorneys are all opposed to it, et cetera, et cetera. And then all the corruption that people are getting paid off I mean, there's a whole system that you can't get a case settled, but if you pay, I'm sure if you kick in and bribe this one or that one, you can get your case heard sooner. I'm sure there's you know, a whole corrupt system to get cases settled. You can pay the judge. You, you slip the judge $20,000 and he'll decide your way. All, all that stuff. So this is threatening the whole system of actually just bringing the parties together, doing the constellation and then they just feel what the, what the outcome is that they can both agree on. So, of course, it's going to meet a lot of resistance, and he's afraid of it. We didn't get into his Jewish background. You know, of course, the Jewish background is there. There's a lot of stuff we didn't get into. Part of it also in that system is that everybody then changes their own label. I'm representing the truth. But here's the truth. Well, who, who made you the truth? I just changed my name on Zoom. Okay, Truth. So that's why I was like, okay, we'll send Truth to the gallows. Let's hang Truth. This guy, big mouth. Well, I did think it was funny that you kept asking who was he talking to, you know, and I can see from that perspective of like a dad looking at his kid that's kind of gone a little bit onto the wild side. Um, <laughs> yeah, who is everybody? Who is he talking to? because it didn't feel like it was really in tune with the constellation. It felt like he was having a reaction to the patriarchy or to me. I just don't want to give the loud crying little boy the stage. I'd rather give it to a woman who is afraid to say anything. And there's of course a reason the little boy is crying. As a crying little boy who gets too much attention, I'm aware of that dynamic. You know, that there's like so much attention to what's wrong with me? Do I need more punishment? Do I need more nurturing? There's just, it's like way too much attention. My dad, my mom, my sister, my grandmothers, like all eyes on the problem child that's a boy. And then the girls, no one pays any attention to them. And the girls just kind of, you know, their bud just slowly like folds up upon itself and recognizing that there's, you know, 20 women and five men in the class. I mean, I want to work with a woman next week. You would like the woman with no voice to be heard next. And I want him to be able to contribute and have a breakthrough. I mean, I'm committed to his intention and his purpose in the class. What he's actually offering is like really valuable. It's like, great. The Highland clearances, fantastic. He said, you need to go back to the Romans for this. Right on, spot on. His judgment is actually excellent. So what next week's constellation could it somehow be whatever it is that wants to bring to the table so that he could by the end of the constellation have opened a connection to wherever it is that he's in high resistance of and then he can be heard better and he can relax a little bit and whatever this topic is because I see that he's got elements of magic high in this field but feeling like he's got it more than everyone is just gonna have people feel contrary towards him i just played that role of a five generations back super mystical grandparent who had full understanding of the mystical avenue but wasn't open to love and he'd shut all his relations down every generation after that Mm -hmm. until he started to open up that love channel and then suddenly he could be heard in a new way where at least there was room for what he was bringing to the table your theme is magic involves magic 
but it's just as revealed in the last constellation with justice <clears throat> you can't push it it's like trying to open a cicada's wings before they unfurl and then they're just going to fall off so my mother tried that when she was young learned that lesson you know much as he'd like magic to be at the forefront of the table it will come out when it's due right to me we are finding the magic but maybe it's just still in the basement like you said once it reaches the first floor then it draws all this attention and it's not strong enough yet i don't think it's at the point where it can speak to power i think it has to continue it's in the mycelium it's still it, it's doing its work and sprouting little mushroom fruits here and there but it's it's not really to to like the little mushroom to tell the oh hey get out of my way you're blocking the sun i don't think we're there yet just opening up a lot. And one of the things I really appreciated about it is it was bringing in the male wound. And I felt a certain kind of sensitivity because men have been so perpetrating that women don't want to hear about how men have been wounded. And I felt a little bit of that because the women have been so hurt by the men in their lives that for the men to take space, take time and, and place for how they've been hurt in their relationships, I felt kind of the resistance to it. You know, it's really in my talk decades ago, women were like really receptive to it because women were interested in understanding men. And at this point, women have given up trying to understand men and they're just wanting to find their own masculine and feel empowered in their own masculine and feminine, not depend on a man to have to bring the masculine into their life. Like they have to be feminine as women and have the men be masculine, that has not worked. So they're taking much more masculine energy into their own lives and they don't buy in to any kind of binary type of description of men this, women that is just, it's like really rejected. It's like heavily rejected. So uh, I recognize that like I'm taking the risk to bring that material in because there's not really a listening for it. It's kind of, it's very 20th century. And I felt like it was a good preliminary to the constellation that followed where we had a chance to do a constellation for a man about the ways that he's wounded and his desire for a relationship, for his own sexuality, for working through his own personal trauma and sexual trauma, and how it expresses itself in relationship with partners. I, I felt like it kind of set the stage for that. And then the constellation itself. So he was wanting to pull in the honest, innocent relating with the passionate sexual side within one relationship and how come they have to be so diverse and then was quite emphatic at the last minute about i don't want to have to pay for it well, actually i i assumed it was money but but paying for it of course comes in many guises so yeah it seemed like uh there was a resistance to commitment was also a different form of of not wanting to pay for it I thought it, you see my perspective, you saw it in the breakout room where I was engaging with my divine partner versus a paying patron who, who really isn't healthy enough to show up for a full relationship as well as isn't actually a match, but just wants to engage in intimacy and, and sexual. And grandfather said at one point that 
the fact that I don't want to pay for it is on the table. That's what's responsible for the fact that then his life became a disaster of things he was responsible for. And that opinion was shared by many. I believe Loving had something to say about it. Certainly Honest Connection had something to say about it, that it just made her steamy angry that that had been mentioned. Yeah, so it seems like a huge conundrum within the human condition for how to be able to engage in our endless supply of sexual energy and desire to engage with one another at the same time that there's all these fragile feelings and boundaries of who feels honored by that or who feels disempowered by that that get in the way. When I felt I don't want to pay for it, I wasn't feeling monetarily, but the way that I pay for it in my relationships, the money's the least of it. I pay alimony. We were legally married and we're legally divorced and those are the terms. And so I'm paying alimony, but paying for it, like when I feel I don't want to pay for it, I feel the flesh being torn out of me. The way that I paid for trying to love her, like what it cost me to fail at loving her to the best of my ability. And having failed at that and been rejected, that's the price that I paid. I didn't want to have to pay to stay with a woman who didn't love me. You know, I'm just reporting my experience of it, but her experience also, she felt like a failure as a woman, a failure as a wife, but I didn't experience my hurt as a crush to my ego. It did, I didn't feel like I'm unlovable. I feel like I'm perfectly lovable, but in a way I didn't blame her or me for that dynamic. I could understand that she found me annoying, but she put it on herself. She blamed herself. And I think she also blamed me. So she actually held a lot more of the negativity, like more of my masculine. I was just like practical. There's other things I could do with my life. I actually want love. I want to find a partner that loves me. You know, it just, the whole thing was like, like much weightier for her, much heavier, much weightier for her. Well, we've all got these, such a large number of, of traumas interlaced. They're making a, sto a story seem real emphatic. Any one of us, it's sort of, Mind blowing. We just did the second of five constellations and I didn't really realize I was the perpetrator. I was called exploratory tentacle. And I just had all this innocence and curiosity and desire to engage. And by the end, it's like, well, you know, if you tell me where the line is, I can listen. Just tell me where that is. I don't know. I can't see it ahead of time. And when I overstep it, I don't know. And when you respond to me, I'm overstepping it by saying, oh, I'm damaged for life. Instead of saying, now this is where the line is. You're not going to cross this line. Okay. This is, it's official. It really sours the whole scene. And that to hold within that, that I was a perpetrator wasn't really possible. There was no space to really own it. I didn't even feel it in myself. I just see myself as this amazing being that's on the planet with a lot of curiosity and joy. In terms of getting back around to your saying that the male wounds isn't really heard and that at this moment, it seems like women aren't even interested in it and just decided to fill in the void with their own thing. That is true to a degree. I've become more masculine over the years because, well, I had partners when I was younger and it had protection so I could unfurl and be more feminine. But then when that wasn't there, in order to activate my masculine, I really had to shut down my feminine side. I didn't have the time or the energy for both. So I stopped wearing dresses and I stopped being open and receptive. And then I'm not even attractive anymore on that level because that whole part's hidden away and shut off. And so it's kind of a bit of a catch 22. I don't think it's that women don't care about the male wounds. I think it's more about 
because the structure is floundering so there's just not enough energy to go around to feed into that I mean that's why from my perspective I think I should get paid a lot and I haven't been able to show up for years because no one really wants to do that because I know that it's a lot to hold that wound if you're really going to hold it and a bit of a catch-22 it's like how do you help a situation when the foundation isn't in place to hold it and listen and when it's only able to show up in its trauma guys so far that came up again and again two different representatives said i can't even hear whatever about him like he's a split personality they don't even see him in the face of himself He's not showing who he really is because the trauma has kind of hidden it. Who he really is. All of us. Mm-hmm. He, he uh, said the same thing and he had it uh, posted to the discussion board. The next day they met and she's like, I can't see you. It's the same as what you just described. I mean, I, I guess that's a sign that some movement is happening. Right. And then they kind of worked through and they were able to connect in a different way from that, like her inability to see him. It kind of shifted him to being someplace where she could see him. And they were able to connect there. So it was a positive for him, the way I understood it. Yeah. But there's still not sex involved, you know? I mean, (laughs) because that would be like the dream, right? Like suddenly she's like... (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Right. Oh, by the way, now that I see you, let's go ahead and tango much more profoundly and I'll take on all of the default trauma (laughs) experiments you've been running on the sidelines also. And and the straight out worship good stuff. Intermingled though it is with a Mm. bit of the shadow. Because, boy, that's tricky to take on, too. Yeah, that's why it feels like a full-time job to be in a relationship with somebody. So if they don't have it set up so that you can be hired as a full-time job, why Mm -hmm. would you do it? It's just asking for the rug to be yanked up from under you. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it's good that you recognize it. So that's another way of, like, not having to pay for it. You know, not having to pay with your soul, not having to pay with your freedom. I mean, there's lots of ways to pay. It's like the the least impactful way to pay is just by putting money so that it can be an exchange compared to Mm -hmm. having to deal with somebody 24-7 when you really want more alone time or, you know, the things that don't work between people because how can any two people like be fully aligned? romantic partnership i've enjoyed the times i've done many of them the the price of having to deal with blind trauma and all the energy that goes in it's not been worth it sadly so i keep Mm -hmm. my fingers crossed that it's still gonna happen (laughs) it's a bizarre human conundrum you know that we have Mm -hmm. the desire for it at the same time (laughs) it's like so rare and hard for it to show up in very many guises at least with our current paradigm and because an awful lot of it is probably around our beliefs right i mean the current paradigm is you know the old paradigm it's not working and the new model doesn't exist and it's hard to do it in a lifetime you only have you know like 50 years to try to unwind a thousand years worth of, you know, entanglements or 2000 years, whatever it is. And you have a few decades with some random people that you meet to try to find the new pattern. It's, <laughs> I didn't know what she started. At, but she became the Falcon, oh, that's which right. is a symbol of ISIS. It's also a symbol of uh, Lilith, and yeah. Lilith is also a succubus. It's actually the same myth that Lilith is the mother of the succubi who steal men's 
semen in the night. They're these female demons that steal semen from men while they're sleeping. And she's portrayed as a night hawk or an owl. That's her kind of animal. And then, so that also seems to, and does at first glance stem from the little boy wound, like the not being seen or heard or not allowed to show up with your masculine power hard on. And so it has to turn the impassioned response into a succubus that's like an unwanted perpetrator because it's been turned into a perpetrator it turns it turns the opposite into into a perpetrator too right the original wound is the masculine against the feminine and then the feminine's revenge against the masculine it starts with the the, the masculine perpetrates first yeah like because exploratory tentacles it just wants to explore right and then the and then the feminine takes its revenge what a mess, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. I would really love to see resolution with this in the next decade, much less, you know, my life at least, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh. In a waking dream. When? As we choose. Well. There were conflicting aspects of how you honor at the same time that you show no respect for the individuals involved. And so a lot has yet to be revealed. And until we can see the big picture, which certainly the internet in this sort of a forum gives more opportunity for, where then you can show that like, you know, I was aboard a, a Frenchman's ship for some months and, and Pete asked me if I wanted to be his sex slave and so it was a bit of a strange relationship I guess but he said that when he was in I think it was Iran somewhere around there at a tent dance a man dressed feminine and but most obviously a man and he was going around the circle and he was flirting with everybody and it was, it was just an understanding in the culture that if you were going to have sex it was first going to be with another man because the women aren't available unless you marry them. So it happens in various other cultures, but it always seems like this shocking aspect that nobody else in the world is doing, even though it's happening all over the world, but it's just hidden because it's so controversial to our current paradigm. And yet it's what's destroying our planet because there's like nowhere to go for sex and there's no way to feel good about it. So instead we have wars and just kill all the sexually primed young 18 to 20 year olds. And that seems easier to address than to deal with their sexual energy and figure out a way to harness and channel that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. One of the reasons that they started these wars in October is because they didn't know what to do with the young men. They were brawling in the communities and they thought it would be better to send them to somebody else's community. They could do their brawling there and they could bring back some wealth. They could harness it instead of leaving them locally. Oh God. That was the pattern of starting wars after the harvest. The Romans started it. Oh, I see. After the harvest. You're done working. And so it was about what can you do with your creativity and then how to utilize this energy so that instead of destroying worlds, you're fixing the problems between the masculine and feminine instead. Now it's like, there's no payoff. It's just a bunch of traumatized people with their own agendas. Nobody even cares if it's me. It just needs to be somebody. And I'm not a robot, so I'm not getting involved, period. And I think a lot of people end up feeling that way. And I've also heard about the jails that it's just like everybody in there has a heart on and you're trying to pretend that people aren't just like jerking off left and right because there's nothing else to do and you're locked up. 
as opposed to the soldiers who start fights with their neighbors before they go to war or whatever. I mean, I call them soldiers, but just your average citizen that's not well directed and doesn't have their basic needs met. I mean, it's not really a need, it's a desire, but uh, in a way it is a need because it totally distracts people from being able to focus the rest of their lives if they're not getting that part taken care of. So it seems to be the underlying thing for humanity to figure out how to come to a different agreement about relationship or else it's like always just pretending that the iceberg tip that sticks out you only have to look at that instead of this huge thing underneath that is what we're built out of as humans. So how do you come to peace with that so that we can actually have a peaceful world? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're exploring in all of these. The whole theme is look under the surface. We just had the next to the last session. I know next week's the last week. How do you feel about the progress? For most of them, I think I'm trying to think of one that really had a powerful healing movement at the end. They all kind of ended when we ran out of time. We had this big field open with all these elements in it. They're illuminating. We saw things that are very powerful, but then we didn't really have the big hug at the end, the release of the entanglement, the movement forward, the sense of being really powerful resourced. So um, that's what I'm aware of. I'm kind of feeling that part's missing in the group work. Maybe this week we'll find something that represents some kind of conclusion. With this last one, when you said, and the grandfather saw there were eggs that needed to be broken. To me, that was a healing movement. It was asking for the partition. It didn't ask for it to go the way that it did and as destructive as it did, but it did say we needed a change. It wasn't the best choice for a change, but some eggs needed to be broken. And every time you've done a meditation at the end, to me, it occurs as a healing movement, not of the same caliber, I guess. You know, it's like hugging your grandmother and the soul statements that shake the foundation, shake it apart so it can move again. I mean, the meditations, you might find them in the meditations. Exactly. Uh, so the meditations would, would have them. What about a theme of like that? Some of the themes that have come up multiple times, like sexual shame has appeared in multiple constellations. Yeah. Um, that's one that, that I think of as has been like times. Another one that's coming many times is the, the, our relationship to perpetrators, like the desire to like cling to victimhood and condemn perpetrators in multiple ways of including the perpetrator and then recognize our own perpetration. Yeah. That's appeared in multiple ways. It's very confused and not as easy to pigeonhole as you might think the whole victim perpetrator it's almost like you just need something to be in tension with so yeah that seems like a super important one because based on this last constellation where she's like i don't want to be the rescuer let's get rid of the perpetrator victim paradigm and then by the end it's like well we can't it's a necessary part it's like having dark if you have light you, you have to have a perpetrator you have to have the victim, but they don't have to be stuck there. So mm -hmm. it's just to be used as a way to evolve. That was literally said in this last one. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's it helps you evolve. Mm -hmm. It's a learning tool. It's not to be used as a, oh, now I'm going to be a perpetrator forever. I've got to watch out, you know, that I don't overstep anybody. And I'm not going to try anything else in my life. And I'm just going to be a very sheltered, unformed person because I'm so terrified I'm going to be a perpetrator or whatever you get stuck in. I'm going to be a victim forever. I can't do it. I'll be used. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I like starting off with kind of a, a core teaching and then doing a constellation on the theme and then learning from the constellation and readapting my core theme based on what the constellation showed. So it, I think it is really important to start to be able to see reality better by understanding what's below the surface of things. 
So we'll see, as somebody said, maybe it was Emily as a suggestion, a prompt to soul that no matter what I do, the outcome's going to be the same. I mean, eventually the lid has to be removed, especially from a system that's exploding underneath and not really working. So eventually, but it'd be nice to have a graceful way to have it come into balance. The one that was in another dimension describing the functionality of things. He's like, it's a very simple gate. All, you know, it's just counterbalance. You just, if you just barely touch it, it opens. It's here all the time. I stay on this side where the magic field is. And because if I don't stay here, it would disappear. Kind of the gate would disappear. But the gate's right here. All you have to do is see it. And then it's easy to open. And somehow we're not seeing it, I think, because humans are so incredibly brainwashable. We're very affected by whatever ripples come through. And we like to think we're independent and powerful and, and more self-motivating, kind of, I think. Uh, I certainly do. But that actually we're super highly influenced by whatever's going on. And so when that conversation includes the multidimensionality or the larger scope, then it'll be easy for everyone to see the gate and open it to the magic field and to how mm -hmm. to own our sexuality instead of put it in a box and lock it away. Mm -hmm. Right. And start receiving the, start communicating with the birds. The last session was the split in how we honor and feel aligned with our mother or center. And that came up in the first or the second one. Dad couldn't find his mother mm -hmm. in the second class. And he felt connected to heartbroken. And, you know, I mean, that was in the last session. He's like, why are you heartbroken angrily to the mother? even mm -hmm. though he didn't know that was the mother. And it's full wraparound right there. Mm -hmm. The fifth session, the children were looking to brothels mm -hmm. for love and understanding because they couldn't find their mother either. Mm -hmm. So it seems like an important thing to kind of thread in there. Or it could be one of the things to help make that story more clear. So what's come up for you around mother in the last few days? Well, the way it ended, I thought it was really disturbing that I sent everybody out into the breakouts to make contact with their strongest spiritual resource and then to represent it and then came back and I felt like you know, what is the kind of the core icon that that is able to hold the center for all of these disparate spiritual resources. And it would be creation, maternal creation and also mother because everyone also has a mother and everyone's interested in their relationship with their mother. So I thought that would also be the center and then to bring her in and then the rep, these representatives were like super hostile to her and she just got attacked and she showed up as full moon mother and everyone, not everyone, but a number of the representatives wanted to be in relation with the dark moon mother. And so they were relating to dark moon and she was representing full moon and, you know, seemed really, like really hurt by it, which I could understand where we are individually and collectively, it's a perfect way to end, is revealing the conflicted relationship that we have with mother and how it just affects everything in our life. Like all our relationships and our own being are all impacted. You know, my uh, um, interpretation of the reason why people turned resentful and attacking towards her 
was because even though she was presenting this large knowing embodiment, there was a hiding happening. She was behind a veil of not fully showing up to protect herself, I suppose. At the same time, historically, that's been a a necessary thing to be doing, kind of overdone though it is. And then it brings in these repercussions. Like if you're going to not show up when you're supposed to inspire everyone else to show up because you're the source of creation, then it is kind of a natural sequence that it would bring up resentment and rebellion and disappointment. Right. Right. I I mean, besides everybody's individual trigger stories with their mother and a lifetime of collecting and lifetimes. Right. I mean, she can't, yeah, she, I mean, she can't really hold us. Earth doesn't hold us the way we want. The moon doesn't hold us. Our mothers don't hold us. We don't hold the part of us that's mothers ourselves. I mean, we all are mothers of, to something. Uh, you know, whether we birth a baby or we're mothers to our animals, we're mother to our projects, in all kinds of ways that we're embodying mother. And of course, we all, <laughs> you know, do what you just described. There's an expectation, a demand of, you know, mother gives, child receives, and nothing really is fully satisfying. So yeah, so we're, it's, I think it's just very reflective of where we are. And I feel like it's all, you know, it's all in tune. It's what we need to see. It's, it was what we need to see. So I didn't feel like it was, I didn't feel like it went off the rails. I felt like it was actually right in a certain sense, it's a perfect way to end because it just revealed very clearly where we are, you know, where this journey has brought us. I think it was very much in tune. And some of that material, because it is so abstract, where we're ending with is the blue light and the Pleiades and like three people at the end, we asked them to just represent their spiritual resource whatever it was, we sent them in the breakout room. The two representing the Pleiades didn't speak. Neither of them spoke a word. Uh, so to me, that's like, I'm like so turned on by that. It's like, wow. Pick on a couple of themes and tell a story with just an opening to think about things. Your mirror is to portal, actually, exactly. You know, they see something, it's like a mirror And then the portal isn't a bunch of answers. The portal is an opening into a bigger space of awareness that is a mystery that you don't actually know, but you can use the mirror as a way to enter this bigger space of inquiry and information will come in. So I love that frame for this is great. We have a balance between feminine and masculine energy and that they inform each other and they find the balance point so that we're able to, again, to be able to bring this life force energy forward, but do it in a way that's not, is not creating a lot of destruction and and grief in our wake, that we're also, you know, aware of the consequences of what we're doing. So I think it's ultimately a humanizing, learning to be human and how to live on the planet, live with other plants and animals and, and other humans in a way that is aligned with our soul and our you know higher values. We'll finish up and put out my very first podcast episode. I think that is a great idea. Podcasts are fabulous. I listen to podcasts all the time. I love them. Because you know what? I don't want to read the news anymore. I know the news. People are killing each other and being hateful to each other. But then we're fighting against the hateful people, and I find myself hating the hateful people. And it just keeps going on and on. And it's been going on and on my entire life, and before I was born.
But podcasts kind of get underneath the surface. What's really going on? You know what I mean? I listen to them and I get smarter. I'm both entertained and I get smarter. So, so I think that's a great idea. Podcasts explain your whole vision of family dynamics and I think family dynamics get passed on again and again and again, frankly. And Jung said once, he said, well, I'm sure he might have said it more than once, but I read this once and it stuck with me. He said, every person has two lives, their own life and their life of their times. So you are Deidre and Debbie, you know, all that. We live our own life. We've had whatever have happened to us, our experiences, our responses to our experience, you know. But also, and you can't discount it, is the life that's occurring around us, the politics around us, the economy around us, you know, the history of other people around us. And I know the trauma of slavery still exists in the family dynamics and the personal interior of black people i know the, the holocaust still exists in me and it affected my family dynamics you know i mean and then there's other things young people are growing into a terrible crappy economy and a terrible crappy climate thing so you're living your own life you're falling in love you're having kids you also have to respond to the the larger issues around you and you have to respond to all the the love and the trauma that were given to your grandparents and great grandparents and, and that also gets sent down. It's it's complicated. Yeah, it is. And anything is simpler if you look closely at it. 